Hello and welcome. Today we will talk about building micro front ends and I've invited Luca here. Welcome to the show, Luca. Hi, thank you for having me. So my, my name is Lukas Domen. I'm a senior consultant from InnoQ and I'm also uh, very interested in front ends and how to build good architectures for web applications, especially big ones. Um, but Luca, maybe you can introduce yourself for a second. Sure. Uh, my name is Luca Mezzalira. Uh, I'm uh, Italian, but based in London. I'm a principal solution architect uh, in uh, AWS. Uh, and in the last uh, um, seven years, I explored uh, the micro front ends topic uh, uh, quite, ex quite extensively, uh, not only uh, writing a book, but also uh, building uh, uh, multiple applications and helping uh, customers uh, to implement this architecture pattern uh, across different industries, uh, seeing different challenges and uh, figure out how to overcome them. So it was a very interesting journey so far. So I hope that we'll continue also for the future. Awesome. So uh, micro frontends is already a word where different people have like different uh, ideas what it means, right? But before we get into that, I want to start with your motivation, right? So why are you uh, looking into this topic? What are the problems that you've seen that led you to uh, exploring micro frontends? Sure. So um, seven years ago, I was working for a company called uh, The Zone. It's a um, OTT streaming platform. Imagine, for instance, Netflix for for, for sport. Uh, we our focus was mainly uh, live content. Uh, it was available in multiple countries that have different needs, and uh, we started to have uh, um, to to grow significantly, moving from tens to hundreds of people, and the tech department obviously was growing as well. Um, the challenge we had is that we don't only develop uh, developed content for web, but also for living room devices, so set of boxes, consoles, smart TVs, and and therefore we need uh, um, a variety of, of teams that could handle all these the, these challenges. And moreover, the team were distributed. Uh, in, on front end, I work in the past uh, on several projects that require tens, if not even hundreds of people working together for delivering uh, a project. But when you have a monolithic code base, uh, sometimes you have some challenges that are mainly due to the fact that uh, there are some decisions that are uh, pertinent and made at some point in time, but then reverting or changing those decisions across the entire code base is a challenge. And on, instead, what we were seeing on the back end is that um, there were, there were distributed architecture that allowed different people to have a certain um, modularity that, and, and flexibility that we didn't have on the front end. So back in the days, I was uh, asking myself, can we figure out a way to have the same flexibility of microservices, for instance, uh, on the front end? And that's basically where everything started. Mm -hmm. so, so one of the things that I... Um, uh, think is the most important part of of um, micro uh, microservice and both micro frontends is uh, the idea of independent deployments right so the the idea that uh, a team can decide for themselves that they can uh, de deploy something without the other teams needing to do something about it maybe you can talk a bit about that topic as well because i think it's very important for our uh, conversation today Sure. Um, one of the characteristics of distributed system, like if we think about microservices uh, as well as micro front ends, is exactly what you described. So the fact that are independent artifacts. And that is not only helpful from a technology perspective, but also from an organizational perspective. One thing that I have noticed in the past is that very often people forget that architecture is tightly linked with the organization structure. And that is something we cannot forget. Um, Conway's law, for instance, states that uh, we usually design our architecture uh, or our system based on how our company structure. That is something that was stated in, in the 70s and is still very actual, in my opinion, and we need to take into account that. The fact that we want to have a um, distributed system, it means that we need to reduce the external dependencies for team because otherwise it's creating more overhead in coordinating the effort. That it is not only for independent deployments, but is also for sharing libraries and many other things that we are used to do when we, we deal with uh, certain type of projects. Now, specifically on independent deployments, I think um, is quite key that we are trying to uh, use best practices that we have learned on the microservices world and apply, if possible, on the front end 
for um, defining uh, some boundaries around the microphone 10, input and output, for instance, uh, and then uh, having the possibility to independently deploy at, at our own piece uh, without the need of massive coordination. That doesn't mean it is, it is always possible. It means that for vast majority of the time, uh, a team day to day is that I'm independent. I can do. I can take my decision. I can go ahead and deploy multiple times per day or uh, every every day, wherever is the cadence that they prefer. However, there are certain situations where, uh, for instance, when there are features that are across multiple. Um, domains of, of our application, or uh, we have a massive change, like, I don't know, a design system that's changing drastically, we need to, to uh, uh, do some coordination across team that is inevitable and is going to happen. But if we can reduce uh, in, uh, I don't know, less than, than five or, or 10 times per year, then we will have a big success because every team is independent for vast majority of the year, and they will be able to uh, uh, take their own decision and moving forward uh, with uh, uh, what really matters at the end for a company. So generating value for the users, because we are often forgetting that uh, we are here not only for write uh, amazing code, uh, but uh, also for generating value for our customers. Uh, and that for me is uh, uh, the key thing that we need to, to focus on, especially Nowadays, where applications are becoming more complex and users are, requ are requiring, uh, let's say, specific features and, and uh, uh, more rich feature, if you want. Um, and in this case, I think uh, modularize our architecture uh, is a key characteristics for uh, any application for the future. Yes. So one thing that you also outlined in your book is that, of course, um, splitting up your system into a, a lot of different systems comes at a cost, right? Like it's not free to, to split up your system, you need to integrate it. And we will talk about that at length in this conversation, right? So you have to do a lot of decisions. So where do you come down on the decision on when to do the split? Do you think you should always like start with a distributed system, like a micro front end microservices system? Or do you think uh, there is a good reason to start with a monolith and split it up later? Where do you think uh, you come down on yeah, that? Yeah, let's start stating that uh, I don't believe uh, uh, distributed systems uh, are a silver bullet mm -hmm. at all. Uh, I would say that that is more a way to solve, um, I would say, an organizational challenge uh, and not only a technical challenge, probably mainly an organizational challenge than a technical one. Uh, I, I think there is a lot of value uh, nowadays working with monolithic architectures or modular monolith even better, as was described several times by Sam Newman in uh, uh, one of uh, the uh, free books that he have written, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> building microservices and uh, um monolith to, to microservices. Uh, I think in, in general, the idea is you need to really think about your context and find which is the right architecture pattern for uh, what you need to achieve. Sometimes for a startup, having uh, um, a quick turnaround, it, it makes way more sense than starting with microservices or microphone tents because you don't even know if uh, your product uh, will uh, reach prime time. And therefore, it's very, very important that when we uh, think about the architecture pattern to implement, we think about what are our priorities. And often for startups, it's validating their assumption or idea, how many customers are interested in that, and then set up the code and the architecture in a way that the modularity uh, characteristics that we discussed before could be uh, leveraged at scale. Because in reality, uh, if we think about architectural characteristics, I think uh, modularity is one that um, we, we, we spoke about that for several years. And in, I created the mental model in my head that you can reach a different level. You can have at the code level, you can have the infrastructure level, you can have at uh, the, the architecture level and the organization level. And those three things doesn't have to be achieved uh, in the first iteration. That you can start with the monolithic architecture with a modular code base and slowly but steady move into a more granular uh, modularity on the infrastructure. And then slowly but steady you move towards the, uh, also the architecture that I believe is the last phase where you are not you have like modularity on the code, on the infrastructure, on the architecture, therefore uh, the organization based on the assumption that we design our, uh, our architecture based on organization structure. If that is true, it means that you can achieve some of the benefit 
uh, that you can have also with, with distributed systems, also with monolithic code base. However, require more discipline, uh, require a certain coordination that you might uh, you might not have uh, to think about when you go further about uh, the um, abstraction that you are talking about. So I think also with uh, a monolithic code base, you can achieve some benefit or, mo or modularity um, at the code base level. And then that will be your foundation for then moving towards a more distributed system. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Okay. So um, after talking a bit about the motivation, I think we should um, shift our focus a bit to micro frontends and away from microservices. Um, so in your book, uh, you wrote that there are basically um, two big categories of doing micro frontends. And this also will lead us to what exactly that means, right? So I prepared this visualization, which I stole from your book, <laughs> uh, which uh, shows like the horizontal split versus the vertical split, right? Um, so can you explain to us? Um, Why, how you can split your application into either horizontal or vertical splits and um, what are like the benefits of those two approaches? Sure. Um, when I started my journey uh, in, in, this, in this world of microphone tents, um, obviously I struggled to find some content available online and there weren't many companies doing that. So I had to figure out and create some mental models that would help me and help Uh, other developers working with me uh, to visualize what we were talking about. And I created what I call the decisions framework in 2019. That basically uh, is one of the decisions is the one that you mentioned. So the vertical versus horizontal split. Um, and that is the first decision. So uh, when you are approaching microphone tents, you need to understand uh, how granular you want to go. That doesn't mean you cannot mix and match both. You can definitely mix and match both, but there are certain situations where uh, one make more sense than the other one. So an horizontal split is when you have um, multiple teams working together inside the same view. So if you reach an homepage of, of a website and you realize that there are multiple teams working on that because your organization is quite large and uh, you you need to add, you have multiple domains that the on page is covering or you have uh, by the type of, of system a certain level of granularity and reusability on my contents that is definitely an architecture that they encourage classic example for instance uh, think about a, an observability dashboard where you have multiple uh, elements that uh, can in, in an on page correspond to I don't know the throughput uh, that you have or the error rates and other things. So those are multiple domains that are contributing to provide a, a final view. And those domains obviously uh, are very likely to be handled by different teams. So in order to aggregate that, you can use a, an horizontal split where uh, you collect different uh, metrics for provide a view to the final user. On the other side, we have vertical split where instead a team is responsible for one view or multiple views. Depend, depends from uh, uh, the type of application that you, that you have. So for instance, if we continue with the example of the observability dashboard, You might, uh, you, you maybe uh, you go in, in the home page and you select error rates as a, a metric that you want to deep dive and understand better how the things are going. So at that level there, uh, you can open a, a new view that, con that is owned by the team responsible for the error rates that goes uh, more in deep about the visualization, the charts that you want to display, and maybe you can do some queries and search and other things. So in that case, you can have a, a mixed approach where you have a team team that is responsible for the vertical split of the application and another one, uh, sorry, and the same team is responsible for the smaller view or the snapshot of the view or the error rate that contribute on the homepage. So as you can see, you can have, uh, uh, let's say, both. Obviously, those, um, those approaches have uh, different pros and cons. In horizontal split, I have seen um, uh, more and more people that are investing on tooling for providing capabilities for the team that is, uh, let's say, rendering just a portion of the view, um, some traction to understand if the microphone time that they develop is working. And also there are some challenges around uh, the organizational structure, because imagine that you have, uh, you're responsible for just one microphone time in the view that is composed by, I don't know, five microphone tents. Let's assume this example. 
How do you ensure that your microphone tent is working? I have seen companies that are decoupling the teams and having a Q&A session that is owned by the Q&A team um, for um, uh, for the, the, making sure that the application is working at a whole. And uh, on the other side, I have seen uh, teams that instead uh, are creating tools for uh, making sure that the application uh, or the microphone tent is uh, working uh, with other microphone tent, in conjunction with other microphone tents, and therefore the investment around um, ephemeral environments, where uh, in that case, basically you spin up uh, a snapshot of the system, maybe retrieving other microphone tents from a more stable version, like staging environment, for instance, and your microphone tent is uh, working alongside. But as you can see, there are more consideration to take into account when we work with an horizontal split. In a vertical split, um, it's more likely that uh, you feel comfortable if you have developed um, single page applications, for instance. That is usually the scenario where if you're capable to develop or you have experience on, on develop, uh, developing a single page application, that is potentially easier to pick up microphone tents because at the end you are going to be responsible for a portion of the system. You can use the whole JavaScript ecosystem without any any problem. And moreover, uh, I think is a, a nice way to ramp up with this idea of microphone tents. Obviously, it depends what is your maturity level inside the team and what you're trying to achieve. But I have seen successful implementation of uh, vertical split as well as horizontal split. Mm -hmm. Very good. So um, one thing that I noticed um, in a lot of conversations is that there are people that have different ideas what single page application means. So uh, I think what you're referring to here is a, a rich client application with a lot of JavaScript may, may, may be written in React or Angular or something like that, right? That, that's correct. So for me, a single page application is an application that downloads just once all the package that needs. Uh, and then uh, the only round trip that is doing to the server is for consumer some APIs. Then obviously you can argue that nowadays there are people using lazy loading and different lazy loading different chunks of, of JavaScript. But in the original concept of single page application, uh, we, the idea was we were moving away from the fact that every time that the user was changing the, the uh, endpoint was refreshing the entire page. We were downloading instead of a single page application, you download the entire package uh, and then you um, at the end you are going to have uh, the entire application sitting on your uh, browser uh, and then you consume just APIs. Yeah, but but I think like th there's still like a lot of um, movement there, especially with things like Hotwire and and technologies like that, where the line is not so easy to draw between server side rendering and s single page applications. But I think we have a, a rough picture of what we mean, right? Yes. Like it's a very client driven application, um, probably with routing on the client side and not on the edge or on the server, right? It could be uh, either way. So the um, interesting part of uh, the vertical split, for instance, if we want to go ahead with that that uh, topic, um, is that the, usually the routing part could happen on the client side or could happen uh, at the uh, edge side. Uh, I have seen working on, on both ways. I think um, if I think architecturally speaking, having at the edge side uh, provides a nice decoupling between uh, the container of these microphone tents that usually is called application shell and uh, um, and, and the a routing mechanism that it if it, it is on the client side, it, it might be non-trivial um, because there are few things that you need to take into account. At, at the end, you are consuming vast majority of the time, uh, an endpoint for retrieving uh, the catalog of microphone tents that are available. And then uh, you uh, you use some logic that you add in, in your code for uh, for the application shell. The challenge you have if you do on the client side and you, you are not paying too much attention on decoupling in a nice way, uh, this catalog of elements with the mechanism that does the routing uh, is the fact that uh, you need to deploy every time the application shell alongside some microphone tents that I have seen as an anti-pattern because Basically, you are creating a coupling between the container of your micro tents and the micro tents itself that represent a business domain. If you do on this on the edge side instead or server side, it depends if you want to go up to the origin. Uh, the, the nice thing is that you, when there is a request from the, the client, the logic running on the server is uh, just retrieving the right artifacts, and that opens up to 
possible solutions like can I do releases, blue green deployment, or even strangler pattern if you want uh, for migrating um, the an existing legacy application or monolithic code base towards a new microphone dance architecture. So thank you so much, Luca, for your time and for your insights. Uh, and I wish you a nice day and all our listeners uh, the same. Thank you very much for having me. And it was a pleasure sharing with you my perception of, of Microphone Tense. Uh, I hope that you will enjoy the book. And thank you again for having me.